Uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Uh, Andreas uh, Munoz uh, Haramijo here. And uh, Andreas came to the U.S. Uh, from Colombia in 2005 and uh, got his Ph.D. in 2010 from uh, Montana State University and uh, working on solar magnetic cycle, which won him the AGU Fred Scarf Award in 2011, which was the first time at that time, uh, first time the solar physicist got uh, in 10 years. Uh, and uh, that year, he also received a NASA uh, Jack Addy postdoc fellowship, uh, which allowed him to work at CFA. And currently, he's a senior research scientist at Georgia State University, and also a visiting scholar at uh, uh, Stanford and Berkeley. And his research focuses on solar dynamo and solar cycle, which he's going to discuss more today. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Stanford's greatest ambition is to kill University of California, Berkeley. And Berkeley says the same thing in football. <laughs> what, are you, what is your position on that? <laughs> I prefer to make no comments. <laughs> I stay away from the fight. <laughs> OK, so you hear me OK? OK, so this is, this is thank you very much, all, all of you, for coming. This is, this is some recent work that I'm, that I'm doing that has been motivated, actually, by observational work that has taken place during the last five years which I feel has not been properly advertised within and how the solar cycle works and also really like use like uh, provide very quantitative strict quantitative constraints that we need to be able to match if we want to claim that our models are a good explanation of how the solar cycle works. And it's all based on the butterfly wings, looking at in detail at the butterfly wings. So the, the, my sources of inspiration and my conclusions, actually, I'm going to start with them. These are, these are the kind of the people that have been working on this that I basically I'm just, what I'm, what I'm going to show you today is the work that I have been doing, trying to put all these things together. Um, what is that every hemispheric cycle follows the exact same latitudinal path. So if you look at how the wing advances in time and gets closer and closer to the equator, every, every cycle just follows the same path, regardless of cycle strength, regardless of cycle asymmetry, hemispheric asymmetries. It's just really a really, really striking result. And I, I will discuss a little bit what I think may that, it, that may imply. Second one is that when you look at the wings the right way, all hemispheric cycles line up in their decay phase. And they all decay exactly the same way, regardless, again, of their um, cycle strength, hemispheric asymmetries, or anything, which also a very, very strong, I think, very, very striking result. I'll show you. Now, using this, I want to argue that the amplitude of the solar cycle is, is also determined by the spatial location of the wings. And that's, that's now my speculation based on these two results. And I'm going to show you the data that I think supports this idea. And that all these together really, really are painting to, are telling me that the solar dynamo is, is, a, is subject, the, play, the toroidal belts from which active regions emerge is, are subject to very high levels of diffusivity. So that means they're probably located within the bulk of the convection zone somewhere. And, um, and we cannot really, or alternatively, you, we, you can, and, and, and also that the transport towards the equator, if you think that it's done by a large scale flow, that large scale flow cannot change in time. Or if, alternatively, you can have a migration towards the equator driven by a dynamo wave. And to some extent, I mean, I, f some, some, I f think that a lot of these things fit so well. But, but I also feel, I worry sometimes that I'm actually like a conspiracy theorist, that, I'm, that I'm, things are fitting too well in my mind. But what I, what I think one of the main purposes of me giving this talk is that I think that it's important for us as dynamo modelers to, to have a discussion about this, because there are very, very interesting results. So really quickly, I'm going to do a, su a summary of how, how we think the solar cycle operates. Okay? 
And so basically, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's this this system that oscillates between two main large scale configurations. One that is poloidal, so R and theta components of the of the magnetic field, and the other one that is toroidal, which is wrapped around the axis of rotation. And the the nice thing is that you can argue that these two kind of phases of the cycle have observational proxies. They're, they have they have manifest a surface manifestation that we can actually look at and measure. And these are the amount of flux that you have at the surface of the sun, which is, uh, for in this particular case, I am I'm using as a proxy the total surface of the sun that is covered by sunspots. Right, so you have here the two hemispheres. And, I'm, and my assumption is that this is indicative of how much toroidal flux you have inside the convection zone. The other one is the, the polar fields. So when you think about the solar cycle, maximum versus minimum, in a sense, maximum and the, and the bell curve of the cycle is a, a, like an indicator of how the toroidal fields evolve, but at minimum, the magnetic field of the sun, the large scale magnetic field of the sun simplifies, and then you can you can convince yourself that the polar fields are kind of indicative of a large scale uh, magnetic field that is permeating in, 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 inside the convection zone, and is an indicative of how the uh, of this poloidal phase, right? So the first part is we go from a configuration like this to a toroidal configuration by the interaction of the poloidal field with differential rotation, right? So you have uh, layers that rotate faster than others, and, and you have the magnetic field lines. Some parts get ahead, some lag behind, and then the faster equator, for example, ends up wrapping things around and creating this poloidal component. And if you look at, the, at these proxies, right, uh, you find this, like the relationship that you would expect, uh, in the sense that if you look at the polar flux during minimum, and how that correlates with the amplitude of the next cycle, right? You, you're looking at the transition from a poloidal, the generation of a toroidal field through differential rotation, the different rotationally differ the shearing the poloidal component, right? And so you have this very nice um, relationship with some cycles that appear to be in a separate branch, and those are actually important because I think. I think I can explain why you have some cycles that are off this diagonal. So we will revisit again this. Now, to close the cycle, you have the emergence and decay of tilted active regions. So here is a, a surface magnetogram with positive uh, magnetic field line of sight going towards you, which is uh, green and blue, and the negative magnetic field, which is yellow and red, that is going into the screen. And you have, of course, joys and uh, low and hail slow. Basically, you have a systematic east to west uh, alignment of these structures. But it's actually quite hard. If you look at all the active regions during the cycle 23, and what you're looking at here is the latitude and time position where you see them. And the color tells you whether they're pointing east to west or west to east. And so most of the active regions during the this active regions during a cycle in one hemisphere are pointing in one direction, with some very few exceptions here as solid red dots in the northern hemisphere. And in the other hemisphere, the direction is the as opposite, and you also have some exceptions. But it's a pretty hard rule. Now the other component of this rule is what is called Joyce Tilt Law. So if you trace a line passing through the centroid of the polarities. This is going to generally form an angle with a, with a line that is parallel to the equator. And this angle is, is what we call the tilt. And if you look at here, this is not the traditional way of looking at tilt, because what you have here is latitude in the, in the y-axis. That The idea is that it matches this picture that you have here on this side. But what you see is that in one hemisphere, tilts hover into one specific sign. And in the other hemisphere, they go into the other side. What the consequence is that you always have, generally, the leading polarity, which is which is the the, the polarity that appears first when when it rotates into our field of view, 
is closer to the equator in both hemispheres. And so this combination, right, this, this systematic east-to-west orientation and this systematic north-to-south north north orientation basically end up giving you that most active regions, like the general contribution per active region to a large-scale field is of the same sign. And when you look at the, at the same data that I was showing you, now what you're looking is the dipolar moment of all these active regions. And now you're combining the east to west with north to south. And now you can see most of um, all, like the majority of them have the same sign. So you build this large scale magnetic field by just adding the contribution of all the active regions. And then you can, you can recreate your, your, the, the, the poloidal field, which should act as the seed for the next cycle. And this is also, you can see in the proxies. So now what you have here is, in, in a sense, it's a proxy for the average dipolar moment of all sunspot groups during different cycles and how they correlate with the polar flux that you have at the end of that cycle. And so, and so now you have poloidal to toroidal and toroidal to poloidal, okay? Now, what are our biggest sources of uncertainty, okay? And for the, to introduce this, I'm going to talk about the kind of models that I normally work with, which is called the mean field dynamo, and so or flux transport dynamo, right? So this is a very simple kind of almost like a toy model, but it's, it's very nice because it really allows us to to test conceptual like concepts of how the solar cycle operates. And it's very simple. You have the induction equation, the, the idealized induction equation, and it basically is. The time evolution of the magnetic field depends on the way the magnetic fields interact with flows and turbulence, pretty much. And flows are large-scale flows, and we, we typically divide them in two. A differential rotation, right? so a faster rotating equator, a slower rotating pole, and shear layers at surface at bottom. And the meridional flow, which is, has been, during the last 15 years, a very important ingredient for in, 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 in the way we think the solar cycle operates. This is, a, this is a power flow that we see consistently in the surface of the sun. We have only started to measure how it depends on depth, because it's a very difficult measurement. But the reason why we like it so much is because if you assume that, if you see this at near the surface, it's all poleward. So it has to have a return flow somewhere, right? And the idea is that this return flow is potentially what is giving your belts the migration that you see. What makes the wings go towards the equator, we have explained this using this large-scale flow. Of course, you also have to somehow model the interaction of the magnetic field with turbulence. And um, I didn't include all the terms in this actually this equation, but basically, the, 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 well, the first thing that you do is, you, OK, the turbulence spreads the large scale magnet, the average large scale magnetic field around. So we model that as a, as a diffusion process. And, but you can also have other mechanisms of, of, of transport that is due, due to turbulence. And you have to be able to close the cycle somehow. And it, although I didn't include the term in this equation, you can potentially ha close the cycle in the sense that re regenerating that poloidal field using active region emergence and decay, which I think is actually the way the sun is operating. But there are other alternative mechanisms with which you can close this. And one is basically the fact that your turbulence has helicity. So that gives a preference sign to the conversion of the poloid toroidal into poroidal fields. OK? So <clears throat> the problem is that we don't know exactly what are the main mechanisms of flux transport or the relative importance. That's one of the biggest sources of, of uncertainty when we talk about the, what we, how we think the solar cycle operates, right? On the one hand, I told you that we give so much importance to the meridional flow, but now that we start making measurements of the meridional flow, this is the latest uh, measurement, and there is a still a lot of uncertainty. The helioseismologists have not kind of reached converge yet. So, but there are, these are two different um, measurements of the internal structure of the meridional flow. In both of them, you have poleward poleward flow in both hemispheres, right? But then what happens with that is still uncertain. Now, you can potentially imagine a flow. This flow, we know, is actually quite sensitive. When you do simulations, like MHD simulations and elastic simulations, 
it's quite variable. It's not this nice, beautiful cell that we have, that we always use, right? And uh, the measurements show that they are, this has a lot of structure, and that's, that's, that already starts causing a problem. Because our models are very sensitive to the meridional flow, and we use that to explain a lot of things, but then we, that may, that then the other side of the coin is that if, if meridional flow turns to be like that, then our models cannot really work the way we want them to work. The other one is, of course, turbulence. So what you're looking at here is the turbulent diffusivity uh, as a function of, of depth, so of, the, of fractions of the solar radius. And here you have a logarithmic scale, right? And if you assume, if you, if you estimate what is the, the diffusivity, so how, much, how strong is the interaction of these large scale fields with turbulence, uh, if you use a stellar evolution model and mixing length and make a quick order of magnitude estimate, you will get this black line. But under the, this formalism that I show you, this is a very strong diffusivity, actually. And, and the, then it's very hard for us to get solar-like solutions. And so what we end up doing is we kind of, comp we kind of compromise. We know that we say, OK, at the, so we cannot escape the fact that at the surface we can estimate it. So we all kind of use the high diffusivity value near the surface. And also the fact that when you cross into the radiative zone is very low. It's molecular level, so you know that. How it depends in how it, it, it changes with depth, we basically, to a great extent, use it as a free parameter, right? But if you use this one, which is like the one that you will estimate based on missing length, that is very hard for, for us to make our models work. And so there is a big uncertainty here, and there has been a lot of debate about, well, how strong is the diffusivity that we should use? But nevertheless, even the strongest values of diffusivity that people doing this kind of models use are still an order of magnitude below the estimates, the mixing length estimates. So, so the, the, the things that I want to show you today, I think, are very important for answering this question. And um, I'm going to start. Oh, the other thing is that we don't know where the seat of the dynamo is, right? So we, we, we see the active regions at the surface. But where are they coming from? We don't know. Our general kind of picture so far, the most prevalent picture, is that they come from deep, deep inside the convection zone. Because that's where there are a lot of reasons. There is a lot of arguments in favor of, of such a, an arrangement. And I think perhaps I don't have enough time to go through them. But the idea is that you, you, you need to so when, when you try to understand where, where active regions come from, right? And the, the most common picture that we, that we use is this buoyant flux tubes that come from underneath. And in order for you to have a buoyant flux tube that has the right tilts, the right uh, east to west orientations, the right properties, and those, those things, they involved the generation of a flux tube with very strong magnetic fields. And so what we say is, OK, well, in order to generate these strong magnetic fields, let's just put our fields underneath the convection zone where they're stable. Because we need to be able to have enough time to put energy into them so that at some point they come, become buoyant. Maybe because you have in that stable layer, the convection comes in and grabs a little bit and takes it out into the convection zone and then become buoyant. And so kind of like the general, idea, the general idea that at least I have been working with as my working assumption is of this deep meridional flow. But there is also the possibility of a surface, what is called the surface dynamo. So you have the entire solar cycle is living very close to the surface. And when you have a deep, when you have a deep dynamo, it's very nice because meridional flow is what gives you migration. That's another thing that, that why we like this. When you have at the surface, then meridional flow goes towards the poles. But you can have the interaction of shear. There is a shear, surface shear layer, in, and kind of like the interplay between this shear layer and turbulent helicity, the fact that heli turbulence has a, like a net helicity, can give you a, a, a also a dynamo that migrates towards the, towards the equator. So this is kind of like basically where a lot of uncertainty is, and that's what I'm going to address slightly during this talk. So my, my working assumption is this. Sunspots are active regions 
arise from these large-scale toroidal belts somewhere inside the convection zone. And so when you look at how active regions, like how the magnetic field evolves as a function of time during the solar cycle, then you have this, uh, the numbers change with time. So you go from maximum to minimum very obviously. And the other thing that is very striking is how active latitudes at the beginning of the cycle, their active regions appear closer to the poles than at the end of the cycle. So as the cycle progresses, they closer, progressively closer towards the equator, right? And they don't, they, maybe they last one month or so, but there's the next one appears in the same place, the same place. And it's kind of like the working assumption here is that they are kind of like bubbles that a scuba diver going underneath the swimming pool breathes out. And where you see the bubbles, you say, okay, that's where that swimmer was, right? Even though you cannot see it, like some murky pool, right? And this is very beautifully captured in the butterfly diagram, right? So if you take each one of those frames, average them in longitude and stack them in time, then basically what you have is during this time, active regions were located in this, between this and these latitudes. As, as time goes forward and the cycle progresses, they get closer and closer and closer to the equator, right? And so you have the migration of active latitudes, the polar migration of their diffuse, diffuse field, which is what builds up the next cycle, and reversal, right? Reversal across the equator, polarity reversal across the equator, reversal across cycles. Now, what the idea that that people that these people that I that, I, that uh, the idea that we're working with is that perhaps from the average properties of active regions we can get some inkling of what are the properties of these underlying toroidal belts and what are they doing. So this is just a kind of like a cartoon, different simulations of of act, buoyant active regions, right? And and again, just pro the concept that they arise from these toroidal belts that are located somewhere inside the convection zone. And so this one is just going to last two weeks, but the next one will come from here, and the other one from here, and the other one from here. So for example, the idea is that the spread in latitude of active regions in a, gives you an idea of the physical size of this toroidal belt and so forth. So here is how we do this. What you're looking at here is a butterfly diagram for cycle 19, which is the strongest cycle we had during the last 200 years. And here you have, for each group in our database, there is a circle here. And you can see how the wing matches activity level, so kind of like the bell curve of the cycle for the southern and northern hemisphere. So what we do is, for a given point in time, in a period of two years, we take all groups in that window and we calculate a histogram of latitudes, right? So you see it here. And we fit a Gaussian to this. So the mean of the Gaussian is going to trace what we call the centroid of the wing, right? That's the mean of the Gaussian. And the sigma of the Gaussian is going to tell you the width of the wing. And, and in essence, the idea is that the centroid and the wings tell you the place where your toroidal belts are centered on and their physical size. That's kind of like the working assumption. And so you have these histograms, right, that we fit to find this as the, as the, as the cycle progresses. Yes, have you looked at, um, is there any skewness in those distribution? Are they really Gaussian? Because it looks like you're Especially your blue one on top looks skewed toward higher. There is some skewness. Yeah. Yes, there is some skewness. But I also was wanted to kind of follow, like build upon the approach that these other people have done, which always was a Gaussian. But uh, but yeah, there is some skewness. You you can kind of see here. Have you quantified that? Yes. Right. No, not yet. I mean, I did quantify it, but I haven't looked a lot a lot to it yet. So kind of like like I'm in this moment, I'm using like um like. A, a symmetric wing. Okay, so almost everything that I'm going to show you now today is basically based on both this path and the wings. That's most most of what we're going to be looking at today. So the first thing is the rails inside the sun, right? The idea that every hemispheric cycle follows exactly the same path, 
And this is quite striking because This is a um, this is some this I'm going to show you the data soon, but this is Royal Greenwich Observatory data. Oh, well, let me just go. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, no, I'll show you. I'll let me just. So the idea that all cycles follow the same path. Okay. So here is the data that I'm using. The I use the Kislovodsk Mountain Station. So this is a survey that this. That in Russia that has been going on from 1950s. The Royal Greenwich Observatory. So this is the survey by the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And that one is actually a very special database. Can you guess where does the data for that, uh, of that database come from? It's yeah, it's Schwab's data. So the person that discovered the solar cycle made amazing drawings several times per day. And they're so good that you can just go, people, uh, Rainer Arlt in Germany went and digitized them and measured the location and sizes of all the spots during this time. And so this is, this is the Schwabe's data. So the solar cycle was discovered in, nine, in 1843 or something like that, and, or 46. So Schwabe looked at the sun during this period and after that, he, he clearly concluded that the, there was a cycle in activity, which is quite fascinating. Because if you think about it, uh, this is the time where Charles Darwin just uh, joined the, the HMS Beagle, before, like 20 years before he published the, 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 the natural evolution theory. And this was the first time that people ever use anesthetics for surgery. This is the, when the American Civil War began. right? And if you look for this for the Eastern Hemisphere, oh, oh, Italy, Italy and Germany were not unified countries yet. So, so, so this is the time where both Germany and uh, Italy completed their 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 unification. And all during these times, this guy was just re religiously looking at the spot, at the sun, and making drawings. It's just amazing. In the East, you have the the first and second Opium Wars, where where the West really forced China to open itself. To Western products, and and force China to actually legalize uh, opium, right? So, and that begins what the Chinese call the century of humiliation, right? Is there a correlation between solar men and opium wars? Oh, yeah, I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the the Japanese Meiji Restoration, when Japan went from being a, having a, a very powerful feudal lords and consolidating power in the hands of the of the emperor and modernizing Japan to be to become an imperial power by the beginning of the 1900s so it's really it's got quite find interesting so <clears throat> really quick these databases have an entry for every single sunspot group you have each day and they are tracked so if a, a group is seen one day the next day you know it's the same one Right, and uh, the cadence for for these surveys is one per day. Uh, Schwabe was looking at things two or three times per day, and so what I do is I I I take each group. I use only one measurement per group. So if a group lasted five days, I only use it at the, at the point with maximum area coverage. So when it was fully developed before it starts decaying. So each dot here is a unique object measurement by by those surveys. So here are the your drifts and width wing with wing widths, uh, right? For every every single cycle except eleven. The interesting thing is that it's seven. I mean, it's just like it doesn't even have double digits the the cycle uh, during the last two hundred years. And basically, what I what I'm saying with the universal path is that if you fit. A functional form, which which we all use uh, an, an exponential. The only thing that changes, with some there is some variability, but generally you can use exactly the same curve for every single hemispheric cycle. The only thing that you need to do is make a time shift, which is this, right? So you have every one of these, right? It's, this is exactly the same curve. The only difference is that I move it in time and make a fit of a delay, and it's an ex we it's an exponential it's just an exponential and it works very well so here is again cycle 19 north the strongest hemispheric cycle we have ever observed 
uh, or at least during the last 200 years. And here is the centroid. So now this is the other thing that is very important. And this, this is where, the thing where things really become very interesting. Because now the path is assumed to be universal. And the delay, basically what shifts the wing left and right, is the point where the wing crosses 15 degrees. Okay, So now you start referencing time to latitude. And that's going to be very important for the things that you're going to be seeing. So now, <clears throat> if I now standardize every cycle to the point, every hemispheric cycle, to the point where the cycle touches 15 degrees, this is what it looks like. Okay, so these are all, these are, we are going to be looking at 36 hemispheric cycles, right? And so you have all of them, kind of they move left and right. Oh, and I'm showing you, I'm showing them in order of cycle amplitude. So I show you the strongest cycle first, and then the weakest. And this is not by cycle amplitude, but by area, the area underneath the cycle bell curve. And so what you, what you may notice is that basically the weaker the cycle, the closer you are to the equator. But you're sampling this curve, right? And so if you have 19th, which is the strongest cycle, 19 north and 12 north, which is the weakest cycle in this period, these 200 years. So you can see, you can significantly see how the path in one is kind of shifted towards the poles, whereas in the other one is shifted towards the sampling, the same path, but in one is the, lat the lat latitudes that you sample are closer to the pole, the other one are closer to the equator. And so, <clears throat> so what are the implications for them, for this, for, from this? It's, it's quite interesting because then if you think that, so if you think that the flux transport dynamo, so basically a, a dynamo that is, whose migration is driven by meridional flow, right? It's correct. That, that means that your, the return flow, the, the equatorial part of the meridional flow doesn't depend on time, but depends only on latitude, right? So that's, that's quite interesting because we have we, the people that, that, that use a flux transport model that, that is very sensitive to meridional flow, have blamed, have placed solar variability on the shoulders of meridional flow. There are, there are a lot of studies, myself included, where we say, oh, do you want to know what you got in minimum, under minimum? Because the meridional flow changed. Or you want to know why you had a deep minimum in cycle 24? Oh, because the meridional flow changed. And, and, and in reality, that's, that cannot be, because now I have shown you that regardless of the amplitude of the cycle, it always has the same path. So now it's why are we sampling that, right? Now, these results are also compatible with a shallow dynamo whose equatorial migration is driven by a dynamo wave, right? So you have shear, a shear that doesn't change that much in, in, in centuries, right? Interacting with a helicity that also doesn't change much in, the, in a 200 years. And so that produces a dynamo wave that also will have like this kind of steady behavior. That's, and so, so that's the first thing. So steady meridional flow. The other thing that is really interesting that you get out of this, if you just follow this rabbit hole kind of thing, is the fact that all cycles decay in the same way. And this is quite striking because it really tells you I think that it paints a very clear picture of how the solar dynamo is operating. OK. So the idea appears when you start using latitude instead of time. So now we, 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 we think, OK, there is a universal path that every single follows, right? It's a monotonic function. So there is like a one-one map between time and latitude now, right? And so you can, you can say, OK, well, here is what we normally, this is the way that we normally look at the solar cycle. It's the bell curve as a function of time. But you can potentially remap this and start looking at the cycle as a function of latitude, right? So now you just make a perfect one-to-one -one map. And this bell curve now lives in a different space, which is depending on the latitude position of the of the of the toroidal belt. So the first thing is okay, let's just still keep looking at things in time. But now every cycle 
gets standardized to a, to, a, to a latitude, which in my case is 15 degrees. And here's what happens, which is quite striking. You're looking at two things. One is just the bell curve amplitude, activity level. The other one is the width of the wings, OK? The color that you see here is the amplitude of the cycle. So the darkest blue is cycle 19 north, and the, and the light yellow is cycle 12 north, OK? So what you see is that once when you reference, when you shift things so that they reference to the same latitude, the decay phase aligns in all cycles. What is different between cycles of different amplitude is when they start. The other thing that becomes very interesting is that r the, r the rising phase coincides with the growth of the wings, and the decaying phase coincides with the shrinkage of the wings. And here is the same picture, but now what you have is everything remapped to latitude. And this is one of the most striking things that I think that, I, that really blows my mind. If you look at the size of the wings as a function of latitude, during the rising phase, they all do their own thing for different amplitudes. But once they start decaying, the width of the wings is equal. This is a y equal x line. The width of the wings is equal to the distance from the centroid to the equator. And let me just show you something that will very nicely illustrate this. And, and our in interpretation of this that was proposed by, by Cameron and Schuschler is that every cycle decays. What drives the decay phase of the cycle is the fact that the wings are touching across the equator. And so here is cycle 12. This is the bell curves for both hemispheres. This is time, normal time now. So, and in this plot, what you have is on the same axis. So this is just degrees. I am plotting the location of the centroid for the northern hemisphere in magenta and for the southern hemisphere in, in green, and the two, two times one sigma, 2.1 times sigma. So the width of the wings for the northern hemisphere in blue and the southern hemisphere in red. So what you see here is that the wings, decay, once the size of the wings matches the distance from the centroid to the equator, then they decay together. And it's the same for cycle 13, right? Did you see this? I will show you it here. You see here the wings grow, they touch across the equator, and then they decay. Same is cycle 14 and 15, right? You rise, touch, decay. Rise, touch, decay. And if you have 16 and 17, again, you rise, touch across the equator, and decay. Rise, touch across the equator, and grow, touch across the equator, and decay. 18, 19. 19 is an asymmetric cycle, very asymmetric cycle. And nevertheless, the blue touches the magenta, and then they come down together. And the red touches the green, and then they come down together. 20 is insane. They're like just perfect one-to-one -one maps. 21, 22, 23, and 24. So 24 is basically the wings really now touch across the equator. And now what you're going to have is that universal decay, right? And so. This means that the solar dynamo is operating in a very diffusive regime, right? Because I, if the fact that I do have a skewness and I need to quantify this, but nevertheless, the symmetric Gaussian is not about approximation. So that means that the entire wing is collapsing. Once the, once the things start annihilating to the, uh, across the equator, the entire wing fills this. And, and it shrinks both from above and from below to, so, to, a, to a size that is, that is the distance from the centroid to the equator. And Cameron and Schuschler used use kind of this universal decay to estimate what the turbulent diffusivity should be. And it's basically mixing length, mixing length values of diffusivity. And so, so what we need to do now is build, so we need to really shift into a frame of mind where, we, where, we, where the solar cycle is, is understood as a process in which that is, the belts, the toroidal belts, are subject to very high levels of diffusivity. And also, I will argue that the toroidal, this means that the toroidal belts are not located in the stable layer underneath the convection zone, or they will not respond this way to their interaction across the equator. So they have to be subject to the diffusivity 
to be able to, to react the way we see them to reacting. And so, <clears throat> and so then this brings again, like this makes all this nicely compatible with the like full MHD simulations where you have these reeds inside the convection zone. And somehow the toroidal bells have this dynamic equilibrium that allows them to survive without becoming fully buoyant. And so it's, it's pretty interesting, I, I, I think. And Cameron and Schuschler think that perhaps this is indicative of, of a surface dynamo. And that what, what keeps integrity, I already told you that this doesn't, when we use these high values of diffusivity, our dynamo models don't work. So there has to be something that is helping us keep integrity of the belt. And Cameron and Schuschler think that perhaps it's the inflows that help counter the diffusion of the, of the belt. But of course, then we need, basically we need to revise and, and make a new generation of models that factor this into consideration. So, so the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is that now we can use um, solar minimum. Defining solar minimum is a, is a diffi difficult problem because you have overlaps. And traditionally, we have always defined solar minimum with, say, cycle n starts at the minimum level of activity and ends at the minimum level of activity. But the fact that you have overlap between cycles makes this a very uncertain measurement. And there is something, as you may have heard about the Waldmeier effect, the idea that this is an observed correlation, I'll show it to you in a little bit. The stronger the cycle, the faster it rises, right? And so when you have a cycle followed by a stronger cycle, this one will rise very fast and will shift your minimum towards the earlier times. If you have a cycle that is followed by a weaker one, then this one rises slower, so that shifts your minimum towards the other direction. And that's important because if you want to predict the solar cycle based on polar fields and so on and so forth, you really want to try to get, like, know when is the best time to make in the prediction. And so the idea is this, that if you use centroid latitude, you can capture much better the individual nature of each cycle than using minimum. And so timing things to the latitude of the, of the toroidal belt is really powerful. So what you have here is, again, the same data, right, with, the, with these paths. And here, I have superimposed on the bell curve the polar fields, right? So for the last, for these cycles. And the idea is that then, if you say, OK, I'm going to look at a latitude of 9.5 degrees, OK? This means that I'm looking at this part of the bell curve for each one of these cycles. And then you can just try different latitudes, and then you make kind of like a scan. And so if you look at this, as you change in latitude, you get closer to minimum, right? So, so you see how you're scanning in every bell curve. You're scanning this universal decay to try to find minimum. And so the idea is that perhaps by I, I, in, if, since every cycle goes the same path, then we can just extrapolate, for example, for cycle 24, right? And I can tell you, well, for all these minima, they, the, the cycles reach minima when the latitude is cert, certain latitude. So for cycle 24, this is when it's going to happen. And indeed, there is an optimum latitude for using polar fields to predict the cycles. So here is the coefficient of determination. So between the relationship of the polar fields at a given latitude in time, when, when the belt is at a given latitude, and the amplitude of the next cycle. And so what you see is that there is an optimum range of latitudes that if you tie the prediction to, the, to, to, to a latitude, then you have the most effective prediction based on polar fields. And in, part, and in case you're curious, for cycle 25, that means that we, for the Northern Hemisphere, July of this year to March of the, of the next year is like that optimum window. And for the Southern Hemisphere, the, there is a big delay there. It's going to be February of 2018 to August 2018. So that, that's, that's the time where cycle 24 is going to reach the optimum latitudes in both hemispheres. And if you look at this is like the optimum latitude, the relationship between polar fields and amplitude of the next cycle. 
And the last thing that I wanted to talk is why 16, this, is, this was deemed as an outlier by my feeding algorithm. Why 16 falls so far off? And that's the last thing. And the solar cycle is missing chunks, OK? So when I, when, I, when I first looked at this, right, here is now the bell curves for the northern and southern hemisphere. And this is my 2013 thing, right? I spent a lot of time trying to understand why these things are here. And if you look at these cycles, you cannot see very well. It's 18 north, 20 north, 16 north and south, 16 north and south, and 15 south. I don't have any data for this part, polar fields. What I found, what I realized is that cycles that were here were kind of jagged and, sh and flat, whereas shark cycles that are here are peaked, significantly peaked compared to these ones, right? I mean, they still have wiggles and stuff, but. And so but what I really felt like I wanted to do is basically take my cryons out and fill them up, right? And so in this part, this basically what I assumed. I assume my working assumption is this. These cycles were going to be that strong, as strong as the polar fields told me they were going to be, but something prevented them from being that strong, right? So what I do is quantify the missing part, right? So this is what I did. OK, this part that is jacked, I'm going to ignore in every cycle. And I define this, I just find the first maximum, the first local maximum and the last local maximum in the bell curve. And then I ignore everything between them. And I fit Gaussian, skewed Gaussians to these parts. So, so you will see for the, the fits that I'm going to show you are done using only the magenta part of each bell curve, OK? And the other thing is that for cycle 15 onwards, I assume that this amplitude is the one that the polar field told me should have been. Okay? So these ones are these ones are not constrained in that way, 12 to 14, but 15 onwards are. Okay. And, and so by definition, then now when you look at the correlation between the polar fields and the amplitude of the fitted. Gaussian, now you have nice match, OK? What makes me think that there is truth in this is the, actually the Wallmeyer effect. I have told you that cycle amplitude is correlated with rise rate, OK? So for each one of these cycles, I calculated the rise rate as the distance between and the, as, the, as the how much the cycle rises to the first local maximum from a point here in, in a fixed point for all cycles in activity level. So I basically trace a line that passes through here, from here to here, and the slope of that line is my rise rate, OK? But I only use that part of the curve, those parts of the curves, OK? And so here is the relationship between rise rate and the observed amplitude. So this is the Wallmeyer effect, OK? The stronger the cycle, the faster you rise, OK? But when I use the fitted amplitude in instead of the observed amplitude, this relationship becomes significantly strong, like significantly better. So the way I'm taking this is that perhaps it is true, right? If you look at cycle 16, cycle 16 was rising much faster than this cycle, right? Indicative of a stronger amplitude than what the other one really ended up having. And so when you look at why is that piece missing? What you're looking at here is, again, every cycle reference to latitude. The darker they are, the largest the percentage of the area that they're missing. So this is basically the color tells you the difference of the curve underneath the black fitted Gaussian minus the, the, the area of the, of the observed curve. Okay? So cycle 16 has the biggest missing chunk. Okay? Now, and these are all reference to latitude, like I show you. If you look at the fitted Gaussian, then you start realizing something. And it's the fact that for any given amplitude, the amplitude that you were supposed to have, 
the closer you are to the equator, the more of your area that you're missing. Okay? You can see a very clear shading transition from light yellow to dark blue at the same activity, at the maximum amplitude. And it's 16. The fact that 16 was closer to the equator that made it so that it had less because it's canceling ac across the equator. Right? So basically, you start so close to the equator that when your wings grow and start touching, that's it. You cannot, you cannot become high any, uh, strong anymore. So for any given amplitude, the closer the wing is to the equator, the larger the percentage of the cycle that is missing. And this is very nicely uh, quantified here. So what you have here is the average latitude of every single spot in a, in a hemispheric cycle. And this is the percentage of the area that you're missing. So when you're far from the equator, you have enough space to grow and fulfill kind of that amplitude. And as you get closer to the equator, you start missing a larger and larger chunk. And then this also can be used to reinterpret this plot. What you're looking at here is the observed area underneath the bell curve and how it relates to the mean latitude of all your spots during that cycle. Now this plot has, this has been known for a while now, like since 2002 or something. And people have always in read this as, okay, if I have a strong cycle, that means that I start closer to the poles. But I th what I would like to propose is that the causality is opposite. If I'm too close to the equator, then I cannot be too strong, right? So my, my amplitude is limited by the fact that I'm closer and closer to the equator, so I cannot grow. So the last thing that I wanted to show you is this. I mean, this explains very nicely why there is a significant difference between the cycles during the space age and the cycles on the early 1900s. Because there seems to be that there is a, there is a dependence on what you're looking at here is cycle number and the mean latitude of all its spots. So at the beginning of the 1900s, cycles generally were closer to the equator in their wings than cycles at the end of the 1900s, right? And, and this, I think, perhaps may be one of the mechanisms that drives long-term solar variability, this systematic proximity to the, or, or, or distance from the equator. Space age cycles are farther from the equator, and that's why they're, they're, not, they're barely missing any area, right? You can see a significant difference in the, in, the, in, the, in the amount of area that you're missing in the early 1900s than from the late 1900s. And so that's basically, so cycle amplitude, I will argue, is limited by the ability of the wings to grow. Right? If your wing cannot grow, your cycle cannot become stronger. And once they start canceling across the equator, then that's it. Your cycle at best stays flat because you have the, 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 the fight between a rising cycle and the, and the cancellation. And, and eventually, they just decay. Right? And that aligns all the cycles have exactly the same decay regardless of the strength. So this is further evidence of a very high diffusivity regime. And then the polar fields are not the only thing that determines amplitude. That's the other thing. So for the last cycles, the last cycles, there was a perfect match between polar fields and the amplitude of the next cycle because they're kind of distanced from the equator. But if we for but now in 24 we don't. I, I'm, say I'm saying, right? So perhaps we're now going back into a time where the cycles are going to be weak just because they're starting to get closer to the equator again. So in order to make better predictions, I guess we have to understand better. And, and that's basically what I wanted to tell you, right? All hemispheric cycles follow the same latitudinal path. All hemispheric cycles decline the same way. The amplitude of the solar cycle is strongly determined by how close the wings are to the equator. And the toroidal belts are subject to very high diffusivity and are transporter, transported either by a steady flow or a dynamo wave. Thank you.
taken after you reconstruct your Gaussians, have you um, tried to symmetrize them about the equator? Because if what you're saying is right, then the decay of a band depends on the presence of an opposite band in the other hemisphere. Right. So if you take them and symmetrize them, and, and does that correlate to the decay or the missing areas at all? No, it doesn't. So that's, that's one of the things. So basically I say, okay, well, if they are canceling, then I should be missing the same amount of area in both hemispheres. But it's not, that's not the case. And I think what I'm wondering is if perhaps, so how much, I mean, how much flux do you have that generates spots versus flux that doesn't generate spots that is still present? In the sense, like a kind of like the the iceberg, right? You have you have you have certain amount of the iceberg above the sea level, and and inside you have significant amount larger volume, and the, if you have an asymmetry between two icebergs in the surface, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an asymmetry inside or something like that. Well, it's not a perfect analo analogy. No, but I know what you mean. So I wouldn't expect the, the difference in areas to be the same. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it not not really the the this area equals that area, but just the sum of the areas. So is is there a net? Is there a net? Is there more diffusion when when it tends to be symmetric? I I don't. I need to. I have not checked at that. Yeah, I have not checked that yet. If you look at the periodogram of the missing bits, you'll find that it's periodic with a two-year period. The well-known quasi-biennial variations. It's the second dynamo cycle in the sun. Um, and it only appears during maximum because it's thought to be confined to the near surface layers. And the primary dynamo is bubbling up, convection is pumping up the end. I all the all the plots that I show you have been smoothed with a with a two-year window. So presumably the the two-year oscillation has also kind of been smoothed now. So these are this is a this is a this is on top of that. This is besides that, I, I will say. In the beginning, you showed a proxy of the colloidal magnetic field. And uh, I noticed that after 1960, the kurtosis became larger. It was rather small prior to 1960s. I've never seen such a plot before. And I think that's me. Yeah, exactly. It's a slower panel here. Mm -hmm. And that may have been because the colloidal fields have never been, been constructed in this way. So how did you actually get hold of the colloidal field? I was aware of dipole measurements, for example, that were exactly only available since 1960. So what I used for... The same kind of data sets? No, I, I'm using since, since the beginning of the, Mount, the Wilcox Solar Observatory, I used Wilcox Solar Observatory data. And before that, I used polar faculae measured by Neil Shilly so, so on I mean, it's so it's a yeah it's a proxy I combine their two proxies so the, the idea that the kurtosis is different might have actually been out of fact it could be there is no way there is no way of really knowing anymore well I guess but do, do the faculty in between 1960 and the present do they have those cusp features no. too no 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 and actually uh, when I when I when I when I published this life Valgar went back to the Mount Wilson Observatory magnetograms. And this, this huge spike that you see here is real in the magnetograms measured by, the, uh, by Mount Wilson. And so, so, so perhaps, I mean, my working assumption is that since they match here, I can, I can show you. Since they match here, I, I'm assuming they match uh, before that, but uh, of course, it now it's uh, besides that it's impossible to really know here. So this is the original polar faculty counts by Neil Chile uncalibrated, and then this one across campaigns because he did it on the 70s, then on the 90s, then on 2000, right? And then here is. Here is the superposition of 
two different reduction campaigns by Neil Shealy, which are this green one and the stars. And you also have Wilcox Solar Observatory polar field measurements, which are the magenta and the black. And you have MDI, MDI average magnetic fields in the blue and the red. So they really match in the, pre, in the space age. But yeah, I could, I don't know. Thanks for very stimulating thing. I started wondering about this question that someone asked a long time ago, is this how good a clock is the solar dynamo? Mm -hmm. So I only, so, oops, sorry. I only started looking at that here. Can you do better than one part That's the question. Yeah, so once you have this, right, then you can just say, okay, I'm going to def define, define one cycle. The, basically, you can trace a line in latitude, and you can calculate the difference between this cycle and this cycle in time when their cross their belts cross exactly the same latitudes, right? And so I only started looking at this and the problem is that even though we have here, what is it, sixteen cycles, right? Two hundred years, sixteen points, you cannot do a, a lot with that. But I if if since you're curious, let me just show you uh, here. So this is the this is the the like a box plot of the this of the amount of time that passes between one cycle crossing a given latitude and the next one, and so the average is ten point. I look at them for different hemispheres, of course, because you cannot really fold them, and the, the average is ten point eight, and it's actually this is something that that Sarah was telling me that I should look at. I'm going to look at how how do this this is basically. The mean, the mean and the six, the 75 and 25 percentiles and this is the extremes of the of the the differences in time so the distance between one cycle and the next is at most in this data set in this 200 years 12 years and as little as 9.5 most of them are actually here within 10.5 and 11.5 now since i don't have so many points then you kind of have this, but it's basically what I want to look is how does this compare if you actually use minimum to minimum to define the length of your cycle? Well, you're basically just looking at the distribution of periods here. Right. So if you, if you were to look, take the whole thing in one shot and just try to fit a, um, a period into the distribution of periods, you look at the phase or the phase jitter or something like that. Or well, the thing is this. the what you're looking at here is only groups, right? But presumably, you have the concept of the extended cycle, right? And so, and so, even if we don't see anything past a given latitude in groups, and past a given time, for a given path, that doesn't mean that the wing and that the belt is not there, and that it doesn't. The, it, as far as I can tell, it changes. There is like a long-term change in the distance between cycles. So, so, so because when you have a strong cycle, this is something that I only started looking. But basically, when you have a strong cycle, the next one tends to be closer. And when you have a weak cycle, the next one tends to be farther. There seems to be some relationship between the, how densely they are packed. And you can almost see it here if you look at this. So here, these are the strongest cycles in these 200 years. And they're more densely packed than, for example, these ones uh, that are the weaker, weaker cycles. And Could be. So what we were talking with with Sarah is that there are two things that delay a cycle. One, 
is where the location of the wing itself and the other one is the projection of this of the the generation of the spots if you have a weak cycle it takes longer for the cycle to ramp up and generate spots when you look at the curve bells you see a significant and even more significant gap when you look at amplitudes uh, but if you look only at wings then presumably you're removing that second component which is the fact that you're building enough flux to generate spots No, if you but when you do when you have the just one quadrant, you're assuming that the other hemisphere is identical. So so whatever you have whatever flux you're losing across the equator, you're assuming that it's being cancelled by the other hemisphere. So that's still I mean, even if you have just one hemisphere, it's presumably the mechanism I, I will argue is again still cancellation. Since you suggested there may be two different types of mechanisms operating, basically wreath building in the bulk of the convection zone itself versus near surface uh, or localized dynamos. Uh, is there anything in your lovely interpretations that might favor one over the other or give you clues that? Um, the only thing is if you, the only thing that I wondered that perhaps will help me based just on this to discriminate is if you have a shallow dynamo that and it's a dynamo wave that that belt is going to be subject to surface meridional flow and so so I haven't quantified any of this I wonder if this kind of little blips that you see here somehow for the last cycle or so maybe are correlated in some way with surface meridional flow changes. Because we know that the surface meridional flow changes. It changes it's stronger during minimum, I think, and weaker during maximum. Do you, uh, Lisa? Uh, it's stronger, excuse me, it's, uh, it's faster during minimum. Yes. And it's weaker during maximum. Yes. So, so, so basically, this, a dynamo wave, surface dynamo wave, is going to be fighting against observed meridional flow. And perhaps, Vari variations in the meridional flow can be used to say, okay, if we see these variations, do we see an impact on drift and how strong? And if there are not, there is no obvious impact of the of the observed meridional flow on the drift, then I will argue that perhaps that is indica indica indicative of a deep kind of wreath, right? Because now that deep wreath is not subject to the surface meridional flow, but that's the only thing that I have come up with. Right, so, so I guess what we'll need to do is take 23, 24, for which we have measurements of the meridional flow. We're, we're working right now on trying to measure meridional flows using the Kit Peak Vacuum Telescope data, so that will be 22, 21, and see if those variations have any bearing on this, and perhaps then you can say, yeah, this is a surface dynamo or not, it's not. So this is not something that I actually did myself. It was done by Cameron and Schuschler. I only measure, measure, mentioned this. But it's basically they use this. Since, since the cycles, once you reference to latitude, their decay phase aligns, then basically they make a kind of like a simple model where they assume they have a belt and it's canceling across the equator due to diffusion. And then they fit, they integrate this model 
and see if they can match the slope of the curve. And when they do that, they find that the, the values of diffusivity that they need to use for the decay of their model to match observations is about 100 to 400 kilometers squared per second, which is, which is uh, mixing length levels of diffusivity. So that's, that's how they calculate it, but I have not made this calculation myself. 